Hi, everyone. I'm in that um, bizarre situation of being between jobs. Thankfully, I know there's one waiting for me on the other end. Um, and I'm also spending my last awkward week at Quartz with all of you people. So thank you for sparing me uh, yet another farewell or a cake or something I really don't need right now. Um, all of you are familiar with Quartz, QZ.com? Um, really, I work best in talking about the stories that we um, really have used to define our brand. So uh, for the next 15 minutes or so, I'm going to try to focus on the stories as the strategy for our engagement, as well as for sending messages to our newsroom and how to do that. Um, I'm just warning you, I'm going to have to go outside the PowerPoint for some links um, occasionally. So it might get messy. Thankfully, journalism is messy. Journalism is not PowerPoint. And I hope you all bear with me. Um, I thought I would talk about how we really think about audience and engagement in everything we do at Quartz. Um, and I have some rules of engagement that are, because I'm in this predicament of kind of looking back on my last three years at Quartz, um, we're in a really good spot where I've sort of said what has worked and what hasn't. And these are not rules that when a reporter comes in, um, we indoctrinate them, but they're sort of things that I've been able to extract um, in figuring out how our newsroom works. I'm, I'm going to talk about them from easy to hard. Um, and the hard is really changing the culture of your newsroom to think about engagement. So the hardest thing is really what we're all um, here for. Um, but the first thing is that many of you, of course, hold titles like director of audience engagement um, and social media is been redefined to be audience engagement. Um, a part of my task as the incoming managing editor of the Los Angeles Times is to keep an eye on audience engagement. Um, but really, the first rule is that we never see it as a separate function, um, that we see this as core to everybody's job. And I'll talk a little bit about how that plays out. Um, of course, the internet expects this. Um, the one thing I think you'll see in a lot of the pieces I'll talk about, which are during most of my time as the ideas editor at Quartz, before I was the executive editor, I was the ideas editor, so commissioning all of our commentary. Um, and it's not a coincidence that what's really going viral online um, are indeed those third party pieces, the first person essay. Um, one reason for that is the authenticity of the writer, but another reason, as you'll see, um, is the interaction that they afford. Um, the conversation is probably not happening on your page, so I'll show you some examples of where we're going to meet readers and how. Um, and this, this is the hard one, that journalists are indeed members of a community, too. Um, let's just go like a little bit old school, right? Which is that um, what was the former sort of reader engagement um, of the old newspaper? It was letters to the editor, um, that you know, old-fashioned editorial page. Um, which, when I came in as the ideas editor, that inbox was actually very, very important to me. Um, and it was important to me that we didn't have a clerk or somebody manning it. It was important to me that people didn't get an automated <laughs> response. Um, it was important that we treated that as much of a component of our engagement as we do Chartbeat and Omniture and all of our other metrics of the newsroom. Um, and don't forget in sort of the data, 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 um, push that inboxes in many ways for editors like me who've been doing this for about well 20 years 15 plus depends on what you count but but for some time um, inboxes are really really good gut check um, of what is resonating and in what ways so this is an example I just wanted to share with you of um, a reader who wrote to us he's a Northrop Grumman engineer and wrote in around right after Christmas time right so it's uh, January 9th we had run a piece about um, how to make sure your kids are grateful, uh, kind of one of those Christmas pieces, right? They're about to get spoiled. How do you make sure you're not ruining your children? Common theme on the internet, right? This guy writes in, um, and I know from his um, email address that he's a Northrop Grumman engineer. When we talk about our readers, know your people, right? I said, this is, this is a quartz reader. Um, my wife and I have 12 children in, fi in 15 years. Well, of course, I'm like hooked right away. <laughs> um, and so he goes on to, and, and you, can, you can read the email, but he goes on to explain to me how they raise their children. Um, now, I get in a back and forth with him, saying, well, what, what did they do every day after school? I mean, it turns into a conversation um, that 
one of the one of the ideas members teams is like sitting next to me and cracking up just because I'm like you're never gonna believe and so it turned into this thing now as conversations tend to do it turned into a story um, and this is one of our most viral stories of course hold on I'm trying to get you the well it's, oh, okay um, and I just think it's important when we say sometimes engagement is the content um, to also look to your readers um, to inform that. Now, this was a heavily curated journalistic experience, meaning there's an editor on the other end who's pulling out of him, as I might in an interview. But if I were to write about why a guy with 12 kids raised his children and they all paid for college themselves, which was the piece that I pulled out of this as mattering, right, to our audience, to a, a global business readership. Um, and so, uh, and then, of course, they like, and then you talk about share images. So it's a journalist, that's me, who's obsessed with how do we package this um, for an experience. But it originated with the engagement. It originated with that letter to the editor. Um, and then packaging this becomes also thinking about the engagement. So the shareable image. Is there a picture of all 12 of you together? No, we haven't had one in ages. Could we Photoshop a pic? And then we get this, which I was like, <laughs> Oh my God. So, so you start to see um, how this might be consumed. Let's go back to, let me help me get back to. Um, okay. Uh, the other way that content might actually be the engagement. Um, I oversaw the launch of Quartz India, which was, um, when, and some of you are probably in similar positions where you launch verticals, you see a market, you see an audience, let's serve them more specifically. Um, India very quickly grew to be one of our largest audience, our second largest on Facebook, um, and then consistently in the top five of source countries for Quartz traffic. Um, that was actually driven by editorial. It was driven by stories that we were, you know, feeding people and they showed up. Um, so we were able to package this, sell it, fabulous, editorially driven, commercially viable journalism. Um, how do you capitalize on that engagement? So often um, we have, you know, speeches from politicians, letters from politicians. Um, Narendra Modi wrote kind of what I thought was a crazy letter in his first month of office. And everybody is tweeting about it, and people are covering it. And so we could have gone and captured that, as we often do, um, and just like run the tweets, right? On the other hand, I was like, is there a chance to just put this out there and let people show up and do the work for us? And so that's indeed what we ended up doing. We did the same thing with the grand jury report in the Ferguson um, uh, non-indictment in November. Um, we've done that with a ton of legal documents, SEC filings, um, where we'll put it up and um, the audience kind of does the work for us. Sometimes it results in more pieces, which I'll show you um, a little bit. Um, I think we all work with a lot of young reporters, and so oftentimes when we talk about the rules of engagement, I think it can be very confusing to, to tell journalists, you know, we expect you to be on Facebook, we expect you to be on comments, we expect you to respond to every tweet you get about your story. Um, and I think one thing that Quartz has done well is to kind of pick, as Jigger was talking about, the conversation on Facebook might be different as the conversation on Twitter. Um, a lot of those conversations get nasty, and I don't want reporters to wade into them, especially reporters that are still trying to figure out what their beat or obsessions, as we call them at Quartz, um, which I'm happy to talk about if any of you have questions about that. Um, but as they're trying to figure this out, you know, is, you know, is humoring the trolls really going to advance anything? Um, and so I think it's okay to like be very explicit. Um, on my Facebook wall, you know, I'll, I'll post uh, uh, like as I did here, a New York Times story about dosas and everybody's going crazy. Does that mean that you wade into the story about dosas? No, right? Save it for what your expertise is um, and kind of pick your conversations. Um, I think it's also important that editors jump in as necessary, so I accept the role of other platforms in this process. Um, I'm going to start wrapping up here just so we will eventually get to questions, but um, sometimes that means joining the conversation, sometimes that means, you know, everyone is talking about the State of the Union speech, what do you think?
Yep. So Narendra Modi shows up at Madison Square Garden, like gets more people than Bruce Springsteen there. It's crazy. Um, we reach out to Facebook and we say, hey, can we like piggyback off this live stream? But, you know, the conversation is happening on Facebook in real time as he's performing at Madison Square Garden. That's the place to do that. Later on, we'll have lots of commentary about exactly what he said. And oh my God, there was a guy painting him live, like it sort of invoked a different type of government. Like it was, you know, it was crazy. Um, there's time for that later, but in the moment, is there something we could do um, either using live stream or we've also used live blogs um, to great effect. Um, I wanted to spend a portion um, talking about annotations, which some of you are probably familiar with Quartz um, and what we do in this regard. There's a quick video on how it works that we can play. annotations was that it sort of takes advantage of that third rail, which is really the third rail of digital journalism, um, in, a, in a very effective way. Um, having been a columnist myself and the victim of a lot of nasty comments, I like that it forces you to be pointed in what you're trying to say. Um, and so it's not, I mean, people do use that space to overall say this sucks, um, but because you have to annotate a specific paragraph, they tend to do that less than when I was at the Wall Street Journal or at Mint, um, and a lot of the comments to what I was writing was, this sucks, please send this woman home. Um, and so I, I think it forces um, readers to be specific. It also nods to the smartness of our readers, right? We, we know our audience. Um, they're very wonky. They're data-driven. They are actually going to go in, um, as they did on the 12 Kids piece, and say, but th this is all state colleges, so therefore, you know, so they like get into the details. Um, and this sort of, again, nods to that reader. Um, we've also used this um, on comments. So commentary, I was very, very focused on, um, and I'm, I'm doing a lot of the India ones just because I know it um, intimately, but I also use it as a really good example of having a niche audience and serving that audience in a way that is like, so in there that it actually has potential to mainstream outward. Um, and India has been an excellent case for us on this. Um, Narendra Modi, a super polarizing election. Um, our most annotated piece yet was actually um, you know, the case of why he should not be the prime minister. Um, hundreds and hundreds of annotations on that one. Um, and I think we also approach beats often in these silos. So Quartz's obsession model covers much more of the phenomenon of our time. In the case of Modi, we haven't been afraid to say it's actually the person who's the phenomenon. And that's helped us also from a coverage perspective and also seizing from a traffic perspective on somebody who already comes with a certain following. Um, uh, I would liken it perhaps to like an Angela Merkel during the financial crisis, um, Elon Musk in the tech space, um, and so it's, you know, again, who are the personalities? I think there was a comment made earlier uh, from Chartbeat about if you put the person's name in the headline, would that have attracted that following? Um, in Narendra Modi's case, I'm not afraid of who doesn't know him. He attracts engagement. Um, along the lines of what we are doing for a particularly engaged audience and how do you serve them uniquely, um, so we know uh, from our metrics that Quartz India readers spend six times more with us than the average reader, um, just in sheer minutes on stories. Um, so two things that we did recently, the Indian budget was being unveiled, really big moment. We actually um, contacted two classes, one from sort of a free market freshwater school of economics, the other from more of the socialist um, leaning, uh, political tendencies, and we asked them, as soon as this budget is released, can you guys annotate it? 
They annotated it live on our site. We invited readers to join them. Um, and then after that, we pull out a piece that kind of takes themes of the budget. Um, and then that becomes another piece of content. So in this case, it's not waiting for the Facebook or Twitter comments on the budget, which yes, we're also chronicling as part of our coverage, but we're also creating or using our existing platform um, for a readership we know that is going to show up for certain stories to engage with us. Um, and I feel like we get, it's, it's again, a different way of training your reporters to think in those moments of the audience when they're plotting coverage. Um, the hardest parts, the cultural shifts in the newsroom. Um, so because Quartz was launched um, in the era of Facebook and Twitter, we think about shareability at the outset of every single story. Um, and that means that our headlines are a super transparent process. We use Slack to, um, to brainstorm them. Um, but it also means that we are thinking about that three-second judgment time that Amy Webb talked about this morning. And so when I think about headlines, I'm, I am thinking about clickability, like let's be honest, right? But I'm also thinking about what are the words that in this story might get you to stop and spend more than three seconds with me? Um, so while Amy was talking, I just sort of like made some notes on what some of those words have been versus what is typical headline So. Some that come to mind, pizza, kids, tampons, toilet paper, rape, hungry, alarms, Chiquita banana, doctor's note, coffee, and beer. And these are all just things that were sort of this like free association wordplay though, but instead of saying um, commodities, could I say coffee? Um, instead of saying students, should I say kids? Because that suddenly makes content a little bit more ubiquitous. Um, and so yes, it's clickability, but it's also thinking both about that niche reader as well as a much more mainstream reader. Remember, my play is kind of both. Um, readers, uh, or rather our, our, our newsroom, almost by osmosis, I hope, is absorbing these lessons, but I do not go out there and say, thou shalt use the word pizza in your story about Kenyan elections. Um, and yet, when we use the, which we did, we did use the word pizza connected to connect Kenyan elections, and they see that that story gets a lift, um, it starts to send messages to your newsroom. Um, reporters and the need uh, to be a part of a community. This has actually um, been a big issue on WhatsApp and other platforms that we can't necessarily quantify the traffic. Um, so I'm saying, you know, you cover startups, like get in there on the startup communities, on the meetup groups, on the, and you can't just put the link to your story and then walk away, right? Um, you kind of need to be a part of the community and again, stoke the conversation, join the conversation. Um, email, we've just recently hired a reporter from the Wall Street Journal who I've worked with um, for years. She's fabulous, Shelly Banjo. But what impressed me was that she had an 800 uh, member um, email that she just kind of sent folks in the retail industry um, when she had certain pieces or what I think she ran it as like a newsletter and I thought this is like the entrepreneurial journalist who's figured out how to put herself at the heart of a community um, and is using email to great effect um, and so now she's covering finance um, for courts um, the last thing and then we have a minute for questions um, is that machines don't commit journalism humans do that pretty much everything I've talked about today is thinking about your reader, but it's a person who's thinking about your reader and marrying data and instinct um, and all of the other lessons of journalism to do that. So we have just like 45 seconds. 45 I hope seconds, we so we have time for one quick question. Does anybody have a question right away? Uh, if not, you'll be around at lunch as well, right? I am at lunch, yes. Okay, uh, I'll run over with the microphone here. We'll go ahead and get one question in. Robert. I'm running. Who was it? Raise your hand again. Somebody over here. Okay, excellent. I think it's great what you guys are doing, and, and I'm a huge fan, obviously. Um, but how do you actually look at um, the depth of engagement that you're getting? Mm -hmm. So it's great to have all, you know, to put pizza in the headline right. and reach a huge audience. How are you then making sure that those are people who are coming back and yeah. engaging with you over yeah. and over again? 
So that was actually uh, the Kenyan elections piece was um, almost proof to me that we could have an audience in Africa. So Quartz is actually about to launch Africa in June, um, partly as a result of um, seeing that if you cover elections through a global business lens, there will be an audience. And it was almost the, the audience that showed up was annoyed at the other stories. I could just tell by the letters that they wrote to us um, saying, you know, thank you for not reminding us that Nairobi is like a dusty place. Or, you know, so I, again, I marry what I'm hearing from readers. They really do write in. Um, and on Twitter, there's a lot of Twitter love. And so I, I, don't, I don't know if people talk about this, but I think it's important to know that like, that stuff also affects sponsors. So when we go out there, and I, I am involved in presenting what this package is going to look like to the advertiser, it's taking the depth of engagement. It's taking the influentials on Twitter. Um, it's taking the, the raw traffic numbers. So yes, you want to make that mainstream play because those traffic numbers need to be high. Um, but I have many, many measures of going then out to marketplace with it. Um, and I think journalists, honestly, this is like the other unspoken part, I think we're better at crafting that story in order to sell the package, um, perhaps, than people who are entrusted with doing that. Okay. Mitra Kalita, thank yeah. you so much. Thank you, guys. <laughs>